episode 225. Welcome to Data Skeptic, a podcast about data science and fake news from an algorithmic perspective. Here's your host, Kyle Polich. Coming to you from Los Angeles, California, this is the only podcast excerpted on the Voyager record. Welcome to Data Skeptic. Hey, if you're getting this on release day, then you just missed our Slack discussion. Every Friday at 8 a.m. Pacific Time, at least for the next couple weeks, I'm going to pop onto our Slack channel from about 8 to 9. Join us next Friday, won't you? We'll discuss the episode, see what's newsy for the week, and just see if this is an interesting extension of the show. One more thing before we get started. I generally call out corrections if I heard the same thing from at least 10 people, or I heard it from one person and I thought it was deeply relevant. This is one of those cases where I heard from a lot of you. Correctly so, you pointed out that I say prepositional logic quite often in our episode on first-order logic when I should have said propositional logic. Yes, indeed. Sorry for my lazy tongue. Without further ado, let's get into our first mini of the season. All right, Linda. Well, today we're going to talk about spam detection, especially with the naive Bayes classifier. Now, I know you don't know about naive Bayes yet. What do you know about spam detection? The email programs we have, Mm -hmm. they claim to use it to uh, filter out spam from us. What is spam? I don't know. What does it stand for? Well, it doesn't stand for anything. It's a name that somebody assigned to a certain type of undesirable email. So they just didn't like the actual ham. Listen, I don't want to get into that part of it at all. They must not have liked the canned ham. Maybe they liked it too much. We don't know. No, uh, they must have hated it. So they named junk email after it. That's a different show altogether. That's like 99% Invisible or Reply All or something like that. Here, we're going to talk about the algorithm. Is it all caps? Bam? Often, I guess. Not necessarily, though. And Just like the ham. Yeah, so interestingly enough, when people make you know little projects for students, they'll label the non-spam as ham. That's what they end up calling it. So you get this list of emails that are labeled as spam or ham, mm-hmm. and you have to build a system that predicts which class to put it in. Ham. Do they use it in conversation? Did you get the ham? (laughs) No, people don't (laughs) usually say, did you get the ham? I think they say, did you get my email? (laughs) 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 Although, I guess we could start that. (laughs) It's really not that funny. You should calm down. (laughs) Did you get the ham? (laughs) Yeah, give that a try at your workplace. See how it goes. Anyway, if you had to design a system that looked at an email and decided whether it was spam or ham, what uh, sort of strategies do you think you might employ? I know for a fact they check servers that have been blacklisted. Mm -hmm. They're just known for sending a lot of spam. Yep. You could probably do an analysis of the email, what kind of words they have in there. There you go. To go more on that route, because while you're correct about the other stuff, I want to focus this show on the content-based analysis. Well, why didn't you say so? Well, I wanted to see where you'd go. That's where these conversations come from. Kyle doesn't tell me what he's talking about. Well, I'll let you know when we get there. Anyway, so you could do analysis. So yeah, one of the familiar email formats is you get an email and someone's from another country and they say, I don't know what it is, but they say something like, it's usually a prince, right? Some royalty. Uh, something like, I need help, just send me $500, blah, blah. I don't even know. I don't even read it, but I remember just something about sending money. Yeah, yeah. So maybe you could filter emails for instances where people are asking for money in that way. But obviously, you don't want to filter out good donations. Right. What about charitable causes? Charitable causes, right? What kind of words do they use? Uh huh. Maybe you want to filter out pornography, but if you... uh label the word breast as pornographic, then Susan G. Coleman's emails are not going to get through. Yeah, you got to look for hot, hot, hot. (laughs) I guess so, something like that. But then you don't want to go too hot because then all the summer sales you're going to miss out on. Right. So we're making a classic mistake that a lot of product managers made in the past here. They, They thought they could solve this with some clever little rule system of Oh, block for this word or this combination of words. And that might get you 60% of the way there, but you'll never get that product to market. You have to take an algorithmic approach here. So what does that mean? What do you do? Well, the common sort of basic strategy you start with, because you start simple, is use something like the naive Bayes classifier. Which is? Well, let's walk it through. Let's just talk about the problem mathematically. 
So first of all, a document can be converted into a vector, right? Too quickly. How do you do that? Um, a lot of ways, but one thing is you can count the frequency of words. For each word in the email, just count the number of times it appears. And that's a vector? Yeah, so you've got uh, one element for every word in the document. All those elements put together are a vector. Of course, there's a probability that can be assigned. What is the probability that a given vector is an example of spam or of ham? So is a vector kind of a visual line? Think of it more like a list of features or a list of values. So like a matrix. Only oh, just one row. A or, vector is only one row of a matrix. Yeah, well, and then each row would be a new email. So you'd end up with a matrix, yes. So then it is. Yeah, yeah, we're getting there. So that's what I said. Yeah, but there's a subtlety <laughs> to it, though. This is so hard, understanding Kyle. Don't worry about that part. That's just implementation. Let's get the conceptual part. So down. anyways, we got a matrix or a vector. So yep. what did you say? Uh, it's actually now purely mathematical. You can ask, what is the probability that a given document is spam, given the vector description of that document? So it, it, does it become a visual analysis? No, no. It's always strictly statistical. When I say it that way, mathematically, it makes sense. It's like, oh, yeah, we'll just have some probability distribution over all the possible emails. But the universe of all the possible emails is so big, you'd never really come up with a good distribution because you'd never have examples, right? So what do you do? Well, you make the naive part of the naive base kick in. You make this independence assumption. You assume that the contribution each word makes to whether or not a document is spam is independent of the other words. So, for example, if hot, you know, hot, 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 like you said, if the word hot is in an email or how many times it appears in the email, that may or may not tell us something about whether it's spam, but it's independent of the word, let's say, um, pharmaceutical appearing in it. So, what you're saying is the word hot and pharmaceutical are independent, but isn't that the case anyways? No, because the word for sale and buy now or something like that if we're just doing single tokens not n-grams then for and sale when they're together will appear you know more often correlated and that phrase would be in a spam document more than a ham document most likely so there are correlations between words this is a weakness of the approach in some sense but it's an assumption we make that allows it to be practically solved because we have not a universe of all possible emails to build as our training set. So you just simplify it and you're just like, I'm just going to believe this. That's right. It's a simplification. It's a clearly a flaw in the method, but uh, it allows us to actually get some work done. So what's the flaw? That we're ignoring information content that the message has. Like if you didn't assume things were independent, you might see patterns that uh, the independence assumption prevents you from seeing. So you guys are okay with the flaw? Well, the question is, how useful is a naive base for span filtering in light of this issue? And it turns out it is remarkably useful in a lot of cases. When you say a lot of cases, you mean most of the email? So yeah. you're saying you're praising spam filters. Is that what you're saying? In a way, I'm praising the naive base approach to spam filtering. But I also will tell you it wouldn't work on fake news because of the independence assumption. So tell me more about that. What does that mean? Even though fake news may, let's say, focus on certain topics more than others, like maybe a fake news article uses the word Putin more times than a typical article. But having that word appear many times isn't enough to be like, oh, for sure, this is fake news. And even the frequency distributions, while they might be good for labeling the class of an article, like this is an article about politics, or this is an article about foreign trade, or things like that, yes, Naive Bayes would be good at that. But saying this is fake news and this is not is really a matter of is it the truth? And an article can be kind of uh, linguistically the same in terms of its you know frequency of word count and stuff like that but one be clearly fake news and one be not clearly not fake news. And there's just not enough intelligence to naive base to make that leap. Would you use a different filtering technique for fake news? Well, we're going to talk to some people in upcoming episodes about techniques they're applying to try and find fake news. So stay tuned for that. So you're not going to tell me. People, you have to tune in. Yeah, you have to keep listening. So let's talk a little bit deeper about the naive base classifier. You have all these independent calculations you can do then. You can look at you know, all the examples you have, you know, break them down into their vectors, and look through your training set. 
how often does a given token, and token here I mean a word, but you might use a bigram or something like that, how often does this particular word appear in spam examples, and how often does it appear in ham examples? So you could imagine the word the, there's probably not much difference, right? It appears probably equally as much in both types of documents. Sure. But the word pharmaceutical, I have a feeling it appears more in spam than in not spam messages. I am Matthew Drury. I am the lead data science instructor at Galvanize Seattle in Pioneer Square. Galvanize offers a 13-week full-time data science program that's perfect for people from a variety of backgrounds. Chemists, physicists, business analysts, biologists, many, many people from many, many backgrounds. Every day there's some classroom time between an hour and three hours on a long day. So in my classroom, my main rules are like we respect each other and there's no embarrassment to asking questions no matter what. One of the things that you should be prepared for if you're a student in the Galvanized Data Science Imperative is writing a lot of code and practicing that as a real skill that you can be proud of. We get students together, sitting together at one computer solving a problem together, switching back and forth between being the driver and being the talker. We also do quite a few case studies to, at the end, go collect some data and put together a, a web dashboard using Flask and JavaScript and all those fun tools. Visit galvanize.com slash data skeptic to check out the virtual information session. While you're there, click on events and see some of the mini campus meetups that are going on. Those could be a great chance for you to explore if Galvanize can help you take the next step in your data science career. I think the most successful data scientists are the people who have an appreciation for this skeptical scientific approach to thinking through a problem. What you really want to do is prove that you're wrong. That's where you learn things. <laughs> learn more at galvanize.com slash data dash skeptic. I'm talking about my spam folder. I never go in there. Why do you go in there? Because sometimes it filters out something that's not spam. And whose fault is that? The spam filter. The algorithm, that's right, yeah. So modern spam filtering uses a lot more than just naive bays. Um, as you were mentioning, they'll do a lot with IP addresses and whitelists and uh, federating the data. There's all types of crazy stuff they do that's way more advanced. But baked in somewhere there under the hood, I'm sure they're still using naive bays in some capacity. And you would advise that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's necessary but not sufficient. So that's why they employ other methods, too. Yeah, because it doesn't do enough. And people start doing things like Bayesian poisoning to try and combat uh, the ability for a naive base to do a good job. That's where it's kind of like a hack of this algorithm where you try and influence the training set to hide your messages. So let's talk a little bit more about how that gets done. In your training examples, you can see the frequency that a word appears in both classes. Like you said, pharmaceutical probably appears often, maybe 50% of the time in spam. How often do you think the word pharmaceutical shows up in a regular message? I mean... Not zero. Yeah, I mean, people are now subscribing to, like, email prescriptions. Sure. Or you could email, you know, like, a relative about what prescription they're taking or whatever. Yeah, totally. So but less than 1%, I would imagine, right, are about pharmaceuticals. Yeah, of 100 emails I have sent... I don't talk about the pharmaceuticals. Let's latch on to that now. We can statistically measure that. And we can say, oh, here's this word pharmaceutical. That is really leaning in the direction of spam, right? But we don't know for sure. So let's keep going. Let's go to the next word, which we assume it's independent. And maybe the next word is sister, you know? How often does the word sister appear in a spam message? I don't know. Probably not that but often. But not that I often. Guess, yeah. I mean, we're just guessing, right? So Probably less than it appears in a regular message, right? Well, we'll just make that assumption because yeah. that, that seems to be your your modus operandi. You got it. Yeah. Run with Making me assumptions. I don't know. These are fair assumptions that there are words that will have different frequency of appearing in the two classes. We know that's true because Naive Bayes works. What it, are the two classes? Spam and ham. Oh, that's a class. Okay. Yeah. You can go across all the words and look at the likelihood they have of being in either of these two classes. And then because we have the independence assumption... The way independence works mathematically is you just multiply the two probabilities together. So you just have this long product where you multiply all of these posterior probabilities you've calculated for each word. And then um, you calculate basically the probability that a word is spam and the probability that the word is not spam. And then whichever is higher, you assume that that's the group the new message belongs to. So that's how it works today, most spam filters? 
Probably not. <laughs> that's probably like 80% of what they do. Like I'm sure they still do that and that's a strong signal, but that probably gets ensembled into a bunch of other things, you know. I just, uh, when you keep kind of coming back to this question, I just don't want to apply that this is the end-all be-all in spam detection. It's still certainly in use the way PageRank is still in use in Google Search Index, but they keep adding stuff all the time, you know, improving it. So whatever the cutting edge of spam filtering is, it's definitely probably gotten into deep learning where it's looking more at the content as well. But deep learning is an expensive computation. So maybe you use naive Bayes, and only when something looks like it might be spam, then you go into the more advanced methods for like the obvious things. Use the very inexpensive computational thing, which is naive Bayes. Okay. So then where does Ali leave us? Well, let's get back and wind up on our main theme. Why are we talking about this if Data Skeptic is all about fake news? I would say it's because, to me, there's an analog here between spam and fake news. Do you see any relationship between those two ideas? Well, I'm just going to take a step back and wonder, though, where do most people get their fake news from? I think it's more social media than their email. Sure. Are people subscribing to fake news? I don't think so. Well, could the social media networks use the same techniques we use to spot spam to find fake news? Why are you asking me? You're the data scientist. What What do you think? Well, technically, we don't know. We're in a world right now that is trying to figure that out. But But you said the the spam filtering wouldn't work on fake news anyway. So why would we use that? Uh, It's the only thing we got until new techniques come out. So then what would you do if you're in this problem? Well, I Your would, Facebook. I would double down on research, but I'd approach it from many angles, you know, graph theoretic approaches, content approaches, how the mechanism of who's allowed to send and like little cool off periods and stuff like that, if maybe that can help mitigate things, who knows? Well, uh, to wind up, let's maybe talk about why I think Naive Bayes wouldn't catch fake news. Why not? In some cases, it would. Like, a lot of fake news is written by non-native English speakers and therefore has these kind of like artifacts of, of poor use of grammar and words and stuff. And they probably use a limited vocabulary and they overuse certain words that seem to trans- over-translate from their language, you know? Because of that, some of the poorly written fake news you'd end up being able to detect because it, the difference there is more statistical or more obvious statistically. But ultimately saying is something fake news yes or no comes down to an evaluation of the statements made in the article and that's not possible to learn from under the naive assumption because just word independence word frequencies these things don't tell a complete enough story they don't comment in any way on the content just the words that were assembled into the content okay so you're talking about filtering fake news from the content level But then I heard, if we're going to talk about social media, that Facebook's example is that it was this company that was buying the ads. So it's more Facebook could look at the odd buying habits of people and companies and businesses. Well, they can do two things. They can look at the content and decide, does this meet our policies? And also, I guess they could ask, do we have appropriate policies? So that's just the filtering side. But of course, people will try and walk a fine line, right? Figure out what they can say that is within the policies, but still meets their agenda or whatever they're trying to do. And then Facebook has some ability to put restrictions on the marketplace itself. You know, like if there's too few clicks on your ad, they take it down or they raise the price or just some sort of mechanism of the ad sales platform they could employ to fight the distribution of fake news. So those are kind of like the two areas that I imagine they're researching. Because you think it's cost effective. Well, just because those are like the two obvious ways to do it. Like, Mm. I'm not saying anything special here. Anybody could come up with that. Okay. Well, my number one takeaway is that there's spam and ham. (laughs) Yep, that's a good start. So, and and they don't turn to each other and say, did you get my ham? (laughs) Right. Oh, last good point. In your training data, which do you think you have more of? In my training data, do you think I have more spam or ham? Well, I think you need more spam. Well, that's what you need more of because it's actually kind of rare in most inboxes, you know? Oh. So you have a class imbalance problem. It's hard to train because if only 1% of your examples are spam, then you're 99% accurate right away. Mm. That's a topic for another show, how you deal with imbalance sample and rare events, but... Uh, That's certainly a problem people have, although Naive Bayes is pretty good at working in highly dimensional problems. So that's another good reason to pick Naive Bayes for something like this. Anyway, thanks as always for joining me, Linda. Thank you, Kyle, for telling me about spam. Thanks for listening to Data Skeptic, where the news may be fake. 
but the data doesn't lie. Support the show and find extended materials at dataskeptic.com.